Uh, thank you very much, Tom. It's, uh, it's always a privilege that you can join us um, and, and share your views. And I think we, we're going to be talking about change of leadership, and I don't envy the, the challenge ahead of those lawyers. I know there's going to be a lot of money, but there's going to be so much. It's taken 25 years to get to that state, to undo it in a, in a short space of time. I'm sure it's going to be a, a really big challenge. <laughs> Lots of dogfights ahead, I think. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, coming this morning. As the, as the chairman for the, the last moments of my chairmanship, actually, I shall hand over formally to Mark Williamson as your next chair for the next two years. Um, this is the, the, the final opportunity for me to, if you like, dictate, as, as a chair may, <laughs> occasionally, the, the subject matter. Um, and the reason I, I've chosen this leadership thing, we, we always need to choose a subject which goes across all our companies and isn't partisan to one product or uh, environment for one member company or others. Um, the leadership, I was asked earlier in the year um, to attend Cranfield, the advanced manufacturing debate, and to discuss there what I saw as, a, as an SME that the industry should really be doing. And in my company, I just reflected on my own experience, and in my company, um, I realised that there's, a, there's something going on in my company which I think is, is probably relevant to us all. Um, and I put together a, a couple of issues. Uh, this particular one, the leadership vacuum, as I call it, is something which I think you'll uh, probably recognise. And um, it, it will, I think, feed on to the, the people who've got the answers. I think I've identified a problem and I'm hoping these guys can help us wake up to the answers. So I'll, so I'll crack on. So I've called it the leadership vacuum, and you'll see why. And there's a little bit of um, about me to explain what Peter's going to talk about. <laughs> That's the agenda. Let me go back here. OK, sorry, excuse me for that. No, no, mine's on here, but I just didn't realize I was going to get these. Ones. So this is the agenda we've got for today. So I think uh, it's not there yet. This is, that's the bit you're looking forward to. <laughs> Eliza, you've got a little program I think we've published, so I think you've probably got aware, awareness of who's, um, it's not really a CV, but it is relevant. Um, I am the MD of Winkworth, we're an industrial mixing uh, manufacturer, design and manufacturer, and we employ about 50 people. Um, I was an apprentice at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, and you'll see why I, I mentioned that. I've taken a degree and I've taken a diploma in management studies, and I'm, and I'm here now. So that's a little journey of me. Winkworth are an industrial mixing designer and manufacturer, and we export machinery all over the world. Um, we're capital equipment, 10 to 500,000 pounds. We're engineer to order business, so it's quite a project-based uh, business. We're six to seven million turnover, depending on when projects get completed. Um, and we employ about 50 people. So it's not a massive company, but it's a company that where leadership is needed. We've got um, no dedicated HR res resource. We've got no dedicated marketing resource. Uh, we've got no dedicated lawyers. So we kind of have to be multitask and multi-talented, really. And that requires some skills. But this is the issue that um, I think has caused what I see in my business, the leadership vacuum. So back to my apprenticeship days. This is, these are stats taken from the RE apprenticeship. This was at Farnborough, the, um, which is now an industrial business park and still has an airfield, but not, not the same sort of five, 8,000 employee place that it used to be. They started apprenticeships a long, long time ago, uh, 1918, 51. They carried on taking on apprentices 100 or so a year and were donating, essentially, those apprentices into industry. They didn't need those apprentices at the end of... At the end of the apprentices, they would stay on if they, if they chose to. The, the, the civil service, if you like, would keep you there. But most people had really good skills, and they would leave the, they would leave the RAE, and they would go and start and join engineering companies or found engineering companies. And there was a lot of, a lot of talent over the years. There's a great alumni of people that have achieved lots of things in, uh, you know, from the RAE. But there was a, it was a really good training ground, very, very solid apprenticeships, and, in fact, as a 1954, my dad joined and did his apprenticeship, the same thing. And he didn't say, son, go and get an apprenticeship like I did, but it just happened that way. But you can see there, there's lots of people have been trained by, by the government, if you like, in depth, and then donated to the community. They stopped in 1992, those apprenticeships. And the civil service typically was a little bit 
behind in industry in, as gen, in general, so probably most of industry stopped apprenticeships a couple of years before that. Uh, and that was really when engineering was going, becoming unattractive. Lots of people were getting different educations, arts, science, service industries, finance, and so on were being promoted. And engineering was becoming less, um, less normal, if you like, for people to go into. And what that, what that means is that um, there are very, very few, what I would call thoroughly trained engineers under the age of 45 you know, around us nowadays. Modern apprenticeships are one or two years and so on, and there's, a, there's an injection in modern apprenticeships, which is, which is admirable and, and good. But actually, if I look at my workforce, and I'll show you a graphic of my workforce, there's, um, this is the work, work of age profile for my business. And it's, it's pretty evident here, I think I'm just here, we've got a, a huge range of talent and people up around this 50, through to 60. I've got a 70-year-old, a 71-year-old working for me. He's fit, he's happy, he does four days a week because that suits him, it suits me. So I'm, you know, I'm not ageist. I've got 66-year-old, I've got two 66-year-olds that have, res, uh, have, given, have surrendered, if you like, their resignation to leave next year. So they've given me about nine months notice and I've got succession planning going on for those guys. But you can see here in 10 years time, I've got to have 20, 20 people replaced in my business if they retire at the ages that they could take a pension. Um, this I don't think is uncommon in our industry because there's a lot of owner-managed businesses in machinery associations. So um, this isn't uncommon. Young people are pretty scarce. I don't know why that's going on. Um, but this gap of 25 years means that there's not a lot of talent of a young age in the 25, 30, 40 year old. And that's a problem for me. And I think it's a problem for all of us. Because in, in talking to other members here on the board, this isn't uncommon. Um, this in apprentice injection is great. And there's lots of noise about that now. I do struggle with the quality of apprenticeships these days and I'm not being ageist here. But I know that when I did my apprenticeship, it had been proven. There had been 70 years or 80 years or so of preparation and practice and dedication to getting those apprenticeships really, really <laughs> solid to make sure that we had good comprehensive skills that were applicable. And, and it gave you problem-solving challenges and so on. They weren't just bespoke for the thing that you're going to do now. Um, modern apprenticeships typically are driven by the host company. And they'll say, OK, well, we need you to do this, you need to do that. So you're probably not getting the same depth and breadth that we did. Um, and you can see the historic, the, the natural age of retirement, 65. Well, that's a drifting date line nowadays. Um, maybe it will happen that way for our, our employees. Maybe it won't. I think some other organizations that have got pension schemes, they can probably see the patterns of people that they've employed and, see, and predict with, with greater ease than I can, if you like, what my, what my guys are going to want to do. So I think we need new entrants into the industry now who are competent and, and can fill that vacuum. If I'm looking for talent to take over in 10 years' time or in five years' time, asking a, a, a fresh apprentice, gray, you know, 20 year old, 25 year old, it's going to be really challenging. And they're going to look around well, who's the leadership? Where's my mentoring coming from? Where, where are the people that have been through these, these journeys before that I can lean on to take on this business? So there's a, there's a really big gap and I think this, it's a common thing for um, lots of us. I use this snakes and ladders analogy just to introduce the next but in industry and engineering has been a victim of this mining would be a classic one the industry changes tidal shift, nothing to do with the quality of the person just the industry the industry has changed We've, we, we're not doing that anymore, we're going to do this we're going to import or, or whatever this, this snakes and ladders thing can happen to you. And you could be a rising star, you could be a really good guy or girl, and yet find yourself redundant because the industry's changed. And I call these uh, promotion moments, ladder moments, you're doing well, somebody recognizes you, off you go, you jump up a few runs and you carry on. You get snake moments that nothing to do with you, probably, and you end up redundant. And this was, because I put this presentation together initially um, springtime, these were announced, these were, these were information on, on job losses anticipated, expected, or announced earlier on this year 
in the in the you can see here retail sector, nursing, doctors, finance. There's lots of people <coughs> having snake moments that have got nothing to do with them probably. Those people, that million, could be a million people going into engineering and into our industries if we do something about it. And we don't need skilled craftsmen everywhere. We need all sorts of, all sorts of talent. And these people in those other industries are talent. Um, young people today certainly are told they've got to have multiple careers. They've got to have, they've got to have transferable skills. They shouldn't expect a career for life in one company, maybe not even a, the same career, not even the same industry. Andrew was talking earlier on about coming from an outsider's into this industry. People need to do that. They need to have transferable skills and, and back themselves. Um, and younger people today should expect, to expect this, and, and we're telling them that. But it's very difficult to transfer industry, to move across. You get a life crisis with a redundancy situation or something like that. How do you go from where you're doing what you were doing and get another job at the same sort of level, if you like, that, that suits your skills and competencies? If you're a bright engineer and you get spotted, somebody might sponsor you and you might do an MBA and you might become an engineering business leader. Or if you take a redundancy situation, you might invest in yourself. You think, I'm better than this, I'm going to do this and I'll I'll carry on. So you go that way. So, so it's common, or it's not uncommon, if you like, for engineers to become MBAs and business leaders. We've seen that path. That's proven that exists. How do you take a non-engineer and do something with them in the manufacturing arena, if you like, to become a leader for us? You need something in the middle. You need some way, some mechanism of helping those people who are outside our industry migrate into our industry. So you need some educational, some day release, some host company, some collaboration, if you like, to, um, to, to build a, a bridge to get that million people to see manufacturing and industry as an opportunity for them. And if you've tried, um, so, so for us, I would say, you know, if you haven't heard this before, recognize this as a problem. You may, I've seen nodding heads, so I don't think that it, it is, this is, really news to many of you. There's lots of, you will recognize it's a problem. Retraining, retrading, reskilling, and then retaining. So this, these are the human things that you need to do with those people. You can do it in a number of different ways, on the job training, mentoring, master's courses, foundation courses, whatever. If we create them, if we create the environment for, if we tell colleges, universities, and so on, this is what we want. Can we work with you? We are a trade association. We should play a part in this. And there are some universities around the, around the country, if you like, that are offering these things. And Cranfield actually do do a master's in manufacturing, but they do it for people who are already in manufacturing. They're taking a bit of talent and say, okay, well, now we're going to improve your, your ability to ma manage in your business by taking your engineering, existing engineering, and give you masters by making you challenge and, and think things. But that's not the same. What I'm looking for is people from outside our industry to be given the tools to migrate. But you can't do it by being an apprentice again. You can't be a person with domestic uh, challenges of mortgages, children, education, all those sorts of things. You can't go from a 50, 60,000 pounds or a 40,000 pounds a year salary and go down and be a, an apprentice, a 20,000 year, a pound a year apprentice, and still keep things going. You need uh, a support mechanism, if you like, that's gonna get you from that industry to this industry. And you have to want to make that journey so you need some basic pay, you need some other government grants, some bursaries or something. You need something that's gonna help you, you know, want to make the transition from your old industry to the, to the new industry that's gonna give you the opportunity that you want for, your, for the next career you're going to have. This bridge doesn't really exist as far as I can see. And it's a challenge to industry, education, ourselves, to identify mechanisms that we can introduce and then go out and attract those people, show them how it could be done, support them in their journeys, to bring them in and to get them across. So we need to, migration is an important word and we need to embrace 
industrial migration. We need to make a mechanism for it to happen. We need to sell it as, a, as an opportunity to non-engineers, non-manufacturing businesses, and to say, this is a career opportunity for you now that your avenue that you started on or whatever is not as attractive as it was. And um, we need to get those people over there wearing those hats into people over here that could be wearing these hats if we're going to fill that, that vacuum. And if we don't fill that vacuum, we're going to end up with a big problem. We're not going to be able to sell our businesses. We're not going to be able to retire. There isn't going to be the leadership. The attraction, the value in your business now is, is going to diminish because when you're trying to sell or you're trying to hand it over to somebody else, you say, well, it's a mess. Nobody knows what they're doing. Where's the wisdom? Where's the experience? It's like a startup, but without the entrepreneurial drive to be a startup. And that will lead into your leadership um, issues, I guess. I say under 20s need not apply. They're being addressed, I hope, with the apprenticeship, the STEM initiatives and so on. So that's what it is. But I think that you've, we've got to grab something in the middle and fill the middle. Otherwise, we're going to have a real problem. And these under 20s and the like that we're encouraging into the industry are going to say, well, I was told to do this, and now I'm looking around, the business has just closed down. He's just sold the assets and retired. So there is a real problem here, and I, and I would hope that I can prick you to think and start talking about it and then we get a campaign going and we do something about it and then whether it's two years or five years or whatever we can look back and say well we've, we've played our part we've, we've done something to address this issue and it is quite urgent I think and it's urgent for a number of our companies isn't it so that's my um, that's my launch for the day really there's a there's a leadership vacuum and I think it needs filling uh, any questions, anything you want to ask me, I'm around all through the day and um, although I've got a vice chairman badge on now, I've been your chair for the last couple of years. I'm delighted to have had the opportunity. I thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm really happy to have served and I'm happy it's in good hands and good people uh, going forward. Thanks for listening. <laughs>